look at the sound of silence, you talk a lot about open awareness. Uh, awareness that is um, not a concept and not something that's created. Uh, I've had a class where we've done some exploration of awareness, sort of touching on it, but what I find is that the elusiveness of it. Like meditation is something I can do as a daily practice, and it's helpful. But I'm not quite sure that awareness as a practice or how to or be more in touch or with breath, uh, awareness as a refuge. Well, it's, um, it's really beyond definition, you know. But like oftentimes meditation techniques we like because you're told what to do and techniques of developing awareness. Uh, you know, awareness is natural. It's not. I mean, if if you were never aware, you'd be dead by now. I mean, you have to, <laughs> like crossing the street, you have to have some kind of awareness of what, <laughs> what traffic is like. And then uh, <clears throat> Driving a car, you have to be really mindful because you're driving something that, you know, can harm others or yourself. So, and and then in, uh, you know, it's the survival. If we if we were never aware, we would die very young. But, you know, we're. It's merely the ability to, you know, we're tending to be aware of things though rather than this open sense. And so, like I found, like when you, you know, like when you do some kind of formal meditation, you're sitting, you do that, uh, sitting practice, and then, uh, then just be aware uh, when you first sit down, of say, just reflect on your body is like this, so you're just, not to, to figure out whether your sitting posture is good or bad, but it's just trusting yourself just to recognize your body sitting is like this. And you're kind of accepting the body sitting. Not, you're not <clears throat> caught in some kind of ideal posture of how you should sit or whatever, but it's like this. And just kind of reflect on the, on the body for a while and then there's the breath, anapanasati, and then there's the mood you're in. What state of mind are you in? You know, are you, is your mind busy? Are you thinking a lot? Are you happy or uh, anguished or despairing or worried or whatever? Just being aware of the mood, the state of mind. And this awareness is, is not is not a critical function, so it's not saying how it should be, but you're just willing to accept the reality of this moment, from the physical body to the breath to the state of mind you're in. <clears throat> so sometimes, you know, many of us started out with meditation techniques that sometimes worked, sometimes didn't work, because uh, you know, the technique is there in your brain, but you're not, maybe not aware of what you're actually feeling in the moment. So you, I've got to practice meditation, but you're all wired up. You've been busy with at some meeting and, and the arguments that arose, and you're stirred up emotionally, and then you're trying to do anapanasati, and you can't do it. <laughs> So the important thing is to be aware of, right now, the, the mental quality, the mood is like this. If it's all, uh, you know, obsessive thinking and emotion and that, just, you can't do anapanasati, it's pointless. But you can accept the feeling, you know, just like, just sit there and let it be what it is. And then it'll settle down. Naturally, because the nature of conditions are, when they come, then they go. <clears throat> so then you're using wisdom <clears throat> to just observe, you know, so you're, you're not going to be the same every moment, every time you meditate, you know, because life is going to present you with different 
situations. Uh, some make you feel good, some make you feel angry. Uh, but the knower of that, the knower is this sati sampachanya. <clears throat> and then and then I encourage you to trust it more. And and even though you know, don't grasp that you've got to have sati and be aware and all that because then it it becomes something you have to do, something that you have to achieve as a person. Just uh, trust your intuitive awareness more. Just if if you're you know anxious, uh, excited, uh, or whatever mood you're in is like this. Just accepting it and bearing with it. Let it be what it is. Then it'll it'll go. These things come and go. Of course. You know, that's the Buddhist teaching, all conditions are impermanent. So sometimes I found, you know, like, I was a, I loved the sitting practice very much. And, uh, you know, so I really liked sitting and meditation. But, uh, you know, then I was always trying to fight against it as if I had negative states or wandering mind or caught in doubt or whatever, I'd always try to suppress them, get rid of them so I could get this samadhi, this tranquility that I liked. <clears throat> and then uh, then I found out that doesn't work, it's suppressing, <laughs> uh, you know, because it tends to, you know, if you're fighting anger, like you feel angry, and you're trying to get rid of it, you make it worse. You're just stirring it up even more. And uh, where if you just know anger is like this, right now the the state of my emotion, the emotion is, is you call anger is like this. And then just let it be what it is, and it'll go away. That's his nature. You see, the Buddha was, wasn't analyzing anything. He wasn't, you know, the, it's not like analyzing or judging anything. Um, it was uh, an interest in the arising and ceasing of conditions. That's it, in phenomena. So, this is all you have to do. You don't have to solve all your emotional problems or, or you know, try to figure out why you get angry or why you feel frightened or things like this. All you, all you, this way is just knowing fear when, when you feel, when you feel that emotion is like this. And then you, you, you're willing to let it be that way. You're not doing anything about it. You're just observing. Then you, and be patient, because the emotions, you know, they, they linger, and and so you, you're willing to let it be what it is, and then you'll be more aware of its changing and cessation, and that's where wisdom comes from. But you have to, you know, you don't have to, but I mean, I suggest that you know, you know, trust yourself more to observe. That observing thing is Buddha, is Bhutto. And then you're seeing the arising and ceasing of phenomena. You're observing the way things are rather than thinking about how things should be, which we tend to do. We're just observing the way things are, and and all, and then this statement: all conditions are impermanent. <coughs> so this relation, you see, the Buddha in the way he taught was making it very, very simple. Is uh, because we're all, you know, most, most of us are educated and have degrees from universities and things like this. So we we have a lot going on in the mind of comparing and judging and happiness, opinions, and views that we get from others and from books, from sages or whatever, you know, from 
religious people or parents, whatever. So we, we, we're full of that. We're highly complicated individuals. And, uh, and then we suffer because we're the complications kind of, kind of cover the natural phenomena we're living in. You know, we can be living in a forest like this and, and be in New York City in the mud. <laughs> so, and New York City, you know, is, is what is it? What is what is New York City right now for all of us? It's a perception. And you're thinking, oh, New York City is in North America. <laughs> But that's not what we're interested in, is it? we're interested in now. And, and so, the, just the perception of New York, it, it arises and ceases. Then you're developing wisdom, rather than, than going, you know, carrying on about you like or love or hate New York City, or you want to go there or you don't. Right now, don't go there, it's freezing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like the human human being is to have because of this retentive memory, it can be a curse because we you know we can become totally depressed and and suicidal because of our thinking and remembering and things like this. So it, it's, uh, it, and, but it's so highly, um, you know, we're so, we're conditioned to attach to thinking as, as reality. So we create the worlds we live in, you know, that, you know, our own personal, built out of our own personal memories and experience in life. And uh, we all think we're living in the same world. You know, we're all <laughs> but actually, you know, we live in our own worlds on that condition level, and that's why, you know, being the head of monasteries and things like that, where you're teaching this, but you, because things that I find very simple to understand, other monks don't. And then I start thinking, they should. <laughs> it goes on like that. It, it doesn't make any sense. Each, each monk has a, has the, has, lives in their own world, even when we're living in the same monastery. It's, you know, what we think, what we remember, which is going to be different for each one of us, you know. Knowing that, then then we're seeing that all conditions are impermanent. So then we're finding a uni unicity in consciousness, a oneness that's always present but seldom noticed because we're we're too bound up in identifying with the bodies we have, with the with the memories, thoughts, opinions, views that we have, and so we. We don't really, uh, you know, we don't recall, we don't reflect on what what is, you know, like the thinking mind is always is divisive, it's dualistic, it's always got this right, wrong, good, bad, true, false. And and so it's, it's, as long as you're caught in the thinking process, you're always going to feel separated from reality. You know, because you see yourself as a physical body, as a personality, it's going to be different from somebody else's. Uh, and then here, very international, so you've got different nationalities with diff, and and there's certain similarities that certain nationalities have that are different and from others. And so we we oftentimes misunderstand or each other and and conflict uh, with our own views and opinions but if you the mindfulness practice then puts you into that unicity that universality of consciousness and then sometimes reflect on 
consciousness has no bound. Everything's in consciousness. The trees, the earth, the sun and moon and stars has no boundary. Where does it end? And if you start, I'm not giving this as a dogma, but just a way of reflecting, because we, Western people tend to think consciousness is in the head. You know, so you, it's in my brain or something like this. So, but in Buddhism, consciousness is, is uh, immeasurable, universal. So, so that holds us all. That's what, what we're all one with. That's oneness. And then uh, the separateness comes in the forms. We all have different forms, different feelings and languages and whatnot that, that separate. So the way out of suffering is, is to get back into the reality of consciousness that before it, you know, it takes on any form. They call that the uh, empty mind or universal consciousness or whatever different names. But uh, and this is just to experiment with your own perceptions, you know, of life from out of yourself. And, and uh, then you can, the more you reflect on just uh, the body as with awareness, not with uh, criticism, you know, not saying it's good or bad or whatever. It's like this. That which is aware of the body, but is not criticizing, not involved with owning it or judging it, just accepting it as it is in this moment. Then you've, that's actually a moment where you've tuned in to universal consciousness because you let go of the discriminating identities and, and habits of separating and you kind of rest. So it's like Lung Po Cha used to always call meditation a holiday of the heart. And uh, I remember when he first, because, you know, he said it in Thai and uh, when when he when I he said that to me, you know, it's the Pakpon Tang Jitai, and then I uh, translated it, holiday of the heart. Uh, meditation is a holiday; it's hard work. <laughs> <laughs> Holidays where you kind of relax and enjoy. <laughs> and, then, uh, and that was my, you know, I was making meditation hard work. Because that's my tendency as a personality, you know, I've got to get it, got to give up and get something I don't have and get rid of these negative emotions and purify the mind and kill the calaces and, you know, this is a typical American, you know, warrior mindset, you know, kill off everything that you don't want. And, <laughs> and that's hard work. <laughs> So, so then, uh, so then they, they, uh, the, the holiday of the heart is stop doing, stop trying so hard. Just open, relax. A sense, an attitude of attentiveness, but relax, not forced, not driving, not you know willful. And this is where you need to trust yourself to recognize that, you know, because you, 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 you all understand the words, but it takes a while to really appreciate that. Because, like, if you're in the, in the competitive mindset where you want to conquer and get rid of things and be the best, then you think, well, you know, I'm not doing anything, you know. I should be striving, working hard. And in Thailand, some of the teachers use uh, these kind of strong words like kill the kilesas, kill the impurities. Uh, but I found that, that for me, kill the impurities doesn't work. 
I think that's a cultural thing too, because I'm from a culture that that always, and, and from a Christian background, where you're, you know, idea of killing the devil and getting rid of the evil forces is so culturally conditioned and, and praised, striving, winning, getting somewhere, proving yourself, are, are powerful, uh, you know, are the cultural attitudes that you're brought up with. And then uh, just not doing anything, just sitting there receiving it. It sounds like a waste of time. <laughs> but, but actually, it, 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 uh, it, it uh, is a kind of holiday, because suddenly you're, you, can, you begin to see you don't have to strive and get and control and, from the conditioning mind. And then you're starting to awaken, wake up to Dhamma. So meditation isn't, you know, this kind of trying, forceful willfulness, but more uh, observing, witnessing, not through judgment. As soon as you judge anything, then it becomes more than what it is. So they use this, the way it is, it's like this, and uh, you know, Lung Po Cha, uh, they taught this kind of the way it is in Thai, Ben Yang Ni Ang is like, this way it is. At this moment, right now, at this moment, you're, this is the way it is, it's not saying whether it's good or bad, or how it should be, but suddenly you're just opening and accepting this moment, whatever way it is, you know, as you experience it in your consciousness. And so it's, uh, it helps a lot in dealing with, with social problems too, and, and uh, you know, we're confronted with so many of political views and opinions and ideals in life and and then we you know we can strive to make things change to what we think they should be uh, so we you know that after a lifetime of that you become you can become quite cynical because you know it's, it's, as much as we want to change things for the better, it's still coming out of this idealism and ignorance rather than from wisdom. And so this, this, this kind of intuitive wisdom then isn't just a passive uh, indifference to, to change. It's a quite, it's a notice of recognition of the way th of phenomena changing. And then our relation to phenomena uh, is one of understanding and 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 then we know when thing when the, when the, if there's something to make things better, we're more attuned the how to do that rather than just always complaining because things are never the way they should be. Yeah it's so easy to let the mind from its sleeps away. Um, do you have any good techniques or ways of maintaining or reminding yourself and be mindful? Well, I mean, it's, you know, con considering you're living in a you know, you're, you're totally surrounded and impinged on constantly by conditions which you have no control over, like the weather or the, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, and your health and people you're with and so forth. But uh, this is a way of training is, and then the mind, the thinking mind wanders, you know, so 
you know, you, you get the idea of being mindful, and but it's still a, a thought process, and uh, and then but then it can wander very easily because that's the nature of the thinking mind. It goes from one thought to another, and then. Uh, but the awareness of the thinking mind, you see, you, you aren't the thoughts. That's why I say don't believe what your mind does. You. You're not thought, you're not a thought. Or, but there's awareness of thinking. So so every time, you know, you you are mindful and then you, you wander away, there'll always be a point where you suddenly you are mindful. You know, you realize you've been wandering away. Like right now, say you're sitting there, where the breath, the body. And then suddenly you're thinking about New York City minus 15. <laughs> and then you're off to London. <laughs> And pretty soon you're in Rome, and then, <laughs> and suddenly, so, huh? You catch yourself. And then, then I recommend just going back at that moment when you realize you're just wandering away. Train yourself just to go back to like the breath or the body, something that's here and now. That the reality of now. So, you, the breath is a good one because you're always breathing. Or the body, if you're sitting, standing, walking, lying down, the body's always here, and now the breath. And and we're not, and we're the posture of the body, more interested in the posture than the appearance. So, I mean, you, you contemplate the four postures of sitting, standing, walking, lying down. Uh, because that, that doesn't create a personal, that doesn't arouse vanity or a sense of personal worth. Posture is just posture. It's not about sitting posture in full lotus for for 24 hours. It's about <laughs> sitting like this, whether you're sitting in a chair or on the floor, it doesn't make much difference. Just use it, you know, use your body as a reference point because it's now, here and now, the breath. And then, then maybe a, uh, start using a mantra like Puto as a way of thinking. Like Lung Po Cha told me, advised me when I first met him because he realized I was uh, obsessed with my own thoughts. And so he advised me, he said, if you, you know, just think Puto. Don't think anything else. <laughs> he said, if you your nature is the thing. I couldn't do Anapanasati even because the, the mind would just wander all over the place. I couldn't stay with the sensation because I was so conditioned to think. And uh, so he using thought then, but limiting to one word, Puto, which means the Buddha. And then uh, that makes sense, you know. At least I'll be thinking, and then you kind of observe that. You, you're not just randomly puto like it just and, and wander, because you can do that too. You can puto, puto, and then be off somewhere else. But you're making it very conscious. So I would puto, puto. First, I had to use it quite fast. You know, I couldn't just say puto, and the mind would wander. So I connect them very quickly, like puto, 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 and then after a while that the tendency to wander stops and more that you have space. This is how, to, this is how I dealt with thinking. And then, uh, and then, like I said before, when, even if you wander away, and that moment where you realize that, just go back to puto, or the breath, or the body here and now and then, and then don't uh, I, I used to you know set goals for myself and uh, for being mindful and then 
and then I'm off somewhere else. I suddenly realize, oh God, I lost it again. And then I, I wallow in, uh, in uh, you know, being critical of myself, you know, and not getting what I wanted. And, and then I determined, just stop that. Stop it. It's not worth anything. It doesn't help. It, it's more deluding than the other. So, so it's just tr this is where, you know, trust yourself is when you find yourself wandering in that moment, you realize, just go like this, back to puto or the body or the breath. It's a way of training because, uh, you know, all of us are uh, conditioned in a different way to always plan for the future or remember the past. You know, so we're always, you know, we can be sitting and then planning our future in a certain way or thinking, being guilty or about things we've done in the past or whatever. And, and so the past and the future, we're always living in the present moment for the future. <laughs> and the future is our perception in the present. You know, there's only the present moment. And, and the, but we, we, we can ignore the present moment by planning always for the future, thinking, I'm meditating now so I can become enlightened in the future. Don't believe that. <laughs> because there's no future. So really, I was being enlightened right now, and that's uh, being aware. <laughs> and also, like, in, uh, I lived in England for. 34 years, so I taught a lot of retreats and things like that in there, and uh, I noticed, you know, how people tend to um, the, the, say that the, the British character tends to be quite self-critical, and uh, so they you know, they, 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 they don't, they tend, different from Americans, which tend to uh, use a lot of superlative words, the English use uh, words that are uh, understated. So, you know, where Americans say, wow, that's fantastic. And they say, well, that's quite, quite good, yes. <laughs> <laughs> The cultural difference, <laughs> but the uh, teaching there, you know, like people always, we always start from the idea that I'm an ignorant person, I need to practice meditation in order to become enlightened. And that's how I started. I saw myself as ignorant, confused person that needed to do something in order to become something else. And uh, that's, and then I did, when I encountered Buddhism, I really, you know, I had a certain intuitive sense for it right from the beginning. Something in me responded to Buddhism that, that I've never responded to any other religion or philosophy. And so, uh, uh, that was when I was 21 years old, and uh, so then you know you find out that that just like what I've been talking about, you you create yourself. I'm an unenlightened person. I'm confused, neurotic mess. I need to do something in order to become something else. Enlightened person is a is what I create. I create that. Nobody's saying that. Uh, you know, it's just what I think, what I believe is, is my self-view. And so then, uh, just by noticing what you create in your mind, who you, what you think you are, and what you, 
you know, in terms of positive negative values are, um, you know, your your abilities or lack of abilities or talents or virtues and vices, all that. You create yourself into a person. And, uh, and so it's not about becoming a better person anymore, it's about seeing through the limitations of personality and the worlds that we believe in and create. And so that's why uh, this mindfulness is, uh, it's called the path to the deathless. And it's, uh, and it's the only escape hatch we have, you know, as human beings, human individuals. Because we, we, we have the ability to refine conditions you know, the best we can do as personalities, individuals, is refine the conditions, make them better, more beautiful, whatnot. <clears throat> but then it still arise and cease, whether they're refined or coarse. And, uh, and so even trying to refine the conditions is, is suffering, you know, because if you get attuned to very high quality things and refined thoughts and refine everything, then the ordinary world can be very offensive to you. You have to live in a kind of utopian illusion. <clears throat> and as you step out the door, you're, you've, you're attacked by the coarseness of reality of the conditions <laughs> that aren't refined. And this is what being human is. It, you're born, you, you get, grow up, get old and die. And why the Buddha emphasized uh, meditation on death and on corpses and on uh, old age. These are the, like Prince Siddhartha when he left the palace. He had these what they call David Dutas. He saw an old man, you know, bent over with age with a cane. And he'd never encountered that in the palace. You know, they tried, the king, his father was always trying to not have him see anything that might turn him towards any spiritual path. He wanted him to be a universal monarch, a great emperor, not a Buddha. <laughs> this is the legend of the Buddha. So, so he, uh, you know, he, take, he sneaks out the gate one day and looks and sees an old man for the first time. What's that? Old age. And then sees a, a man, uh, lying in, with a fever, sick and in misery and that sickness and then uh, and then he sees a corpse, human corpse, death and then he sees a, a samana or a monk and that so so this, these are the, the teachers that are teaching us like the monk represents is an archetype for uh, spiritual reality. There's old age, sickness, death, and then the way out of this realm of birth and death. So like the, the, the samana or the monk is a, is a kind of archetypal form for the way to transcend the conditioned world, not be just caught in the vortex, the whirlpool of changing conditions. But take in your mind always just to come back to the present. Just say, just, you see yourself wandering and, and you come, then stop the criticizing yourself for wandering. I, I made a determination, I'm not going to do that. Because it, it, it has no it tends to keep you in a state of, of feeling you're failing all the time and you can't do it. You know, it feeds that kind of perception of yourself. So, so stop it and then just uh, determine to go come back into the present moment with puto or the breath or the body or, and then this attentiveness I mean, it was to bring this attention to the present moment, not to... You know, uh, the whole sole purpose is to be here and now, rather than 
someone trying to practice now to get something in the future. Does that help you? <laughs> and you can do this like a formal way or even try it when you're just traveling or anywhere. You know? Like, like I, the past years I've traveled a lot, you know, internationally. So I was going into airports, waiting in lines, and then you get to your destination and you have to wait for your baggage. <laughs> and, uh, and I found like waiting in lines, my personality is one, is, it's not coming, where is the, where is my suitcase? <laughs> and you get all this kind of tense, this thing, and maybe they lost it, the airlines lose things. And, or waiting, you know, to get through immigration and the, this kind of slow process, and you feel this. And what are they? Why are they so slow? I used to go in the airport, look for what, what looks like the shortest line, and what's <laughs> moving. <laughs> and so I, I started seeing that the suffering of this. So I started just thinking that just I'll just go into this empty state, whip, yeah. choose a line and observe this, this, this impulse to want to get out, get through the line or get the bag on the carousel and things like this, you know, this impatience. So you can integrate it, you know, in, into just ordinary things like that, waiting in a traffic jam in Bangkok or whatever. I mean, it works on it helps to, to you were to integrate mindfulness into ordinary life not just sitting in a quiet place but in the middle of a traffic jam or a battlefield <laughs> Whatever. also it works like in in uh, when you're in a situation where there's a lot of acrimony or quarrels going on to bring yourself into the present. Keep cultivating that. And after a while, it, it starts connecting your moments of mindfulness, and rather than just flashes and then you've lost it, it starts you seeing it's a con continuum, it's not just a momentary flash and it's gone. Because it's the background that everything manifests on. So you, you, you it's like a, like a movie screen. You know, like you have all these projections onto the movie screen. The movie screen's always white and there, but the the movie can be all different kind of actions and and colors and different people and war and peace and whatnot. But the 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 background's always there, the screen. And so like learning to be that screen in which the 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 uh, conditions arise and cease. And so consciousness is learning to recognize consciousness like this. And then, the, and I've developed this over years, so it's like very easy to do now. But at first, you know, it was the, because of my condition, conditioning was, you know, I was losing it and wandering away. And then uh, feeling, oh, I'm not, I can't do it, I'm just too, you know, you start creating yourself with the, like you can't do it, you're not prepared, or you don't have enough mindfulness, or whatever way you you tend to go. But then it's just this humble kind of you you know you're thinking about something and back into the pre present, the mindfulness in the present, and like a book, sound of silence. And I, I began to notice this resonating background to everything. 
like a vibration that has as a continuum and and as I began to recognize that more I could establish myself with that and uh, and I then I could see it was a, it's a, a continuum that I don't create not a personal creation but it's here and now and then if you and, and it helps you to establish mindfulness so it, it continues rather than just momentary flashes of mindfulness and then you're lost again. <laughs>